Our next speaker this morning, and I think Dennis set it up nicely, and yesterday Tom Osbada uh, was talking a lot about uh, where we really need to get to in our thinking about valuing and putting dollar num uh, amounts on, on the services that what we're all doing provide. And we discovered uh, David Bachter of Earth Economics during a, a webinar that EPA Region 10 put on and, and um, uh, ended up doing a Q&A and we're just like, oh my God, you know, this is, this really puts a lot of the pieces of the puzzle together. So I'm not going to read uh, David's bio, but what I would like to say is he uh, recently co-authored a book called What's the Economy for Anyway? And uh, has copies available if anybody wants an autographed copy to buy. Um, I got mine and I'm looking forward to reading it on the plane ride home. So with that, we'll, uh, welcome Dave. Thank you very much, Nora. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the in sort of economics in general and why the biocycle community is so important for the 21st century, and uh, then talk a little bit about ecosystem services, and then a few other things on looking at appraising the value that you're providing, doing the accounting for that value, and then the funding mechanisms, income, assets, and such. So first of all, Think about 1912, 100 years ago. That big green bridge wasn't out there across the, the, the Columbia River. That was built in 1917, which was a pretty big, pretty impressive, I thought. This country was a nation of dirt tracks, outdoor plumbing, organic farms. I mean, that's what the United States was. Horses did most of the, the powering of the, our nation at that time. And it was tough. And we needed a new economic philosophy, really, these are children from the coal mines. We had about 18% of children worked full-time jobs and more at that time. The, I show my kids these fo photos when they complain about chores. <laughs> it's like, you've got it easy, you know? So, and if we, if we think about it, at that time, if you needed more salmon, for example, we needed more boats and nets. Just go out and catch them. They're out there. Natural capital was plentiful. Built capital was scarce. And so we had an economics that has reflected that. And if you think about it, 1912, all we had was what's called microeconomics. And that's the economics of firms, households, small businesses, and markets. And that's all we had. And it wasn't sufficient. By 1930, we really had a crisis because we had still gold as our commodity trading. Um, we had no measures at this time, e macroeconomic measures. There, were, there was no GDP, no measure of unemployment, no measure of inflation, no measure of the money supply, no measure of how many durable goods we produced in the country. People had no idea how much stuff was produced in the United States. And as a result, we hit, because the economy had been transformed, so economies don't just change or they don't just grow, in fact, they're transformed. We went, okay, we went from 1 million horses to 20 million horses in the United States. Then we had the automobile and the internal combustion engine. Hey, that was a big change. We went from the Library of Congress to having the Library of Congress handy at your fingertips. So the nature of economies is that they are really transformed. And, um, and so we got macroeconomics. We didn't have it before. Then we got new measures. And I, I want you to think about this, because this is critical to the biocycle community. We got new goals, like let's produce more stuff. Let's reduce unemployment, since we're in a depression, it's a crisis. Uh, we got new measures for those things, GDP, unemployment, inflation, etc. We became very good at measuring our built capital, because we didn't have much of it and we wanted a lot more of it. And then we got new institutions. The agriculture department was in, it expanded, um, social security, on and on. And this was the basis for a real 20th century economy. And we're a nonprofit. We title ourselves Earth Economics because there's still something not in the equation. Just like we didn't measure uh, GDP or unemployment in the 30s, no one had ever measured unemployment, um, we haven't been measuring the benefits of our soil. That's crazy. We're not looking at it as a capital asset. We're not looking at the full value of our air and water. You know, if you, I think about EPA and what EPA oversees our air, our water, our health, 
think about the capital asset value of those assets. And then you'd think, gee, they have a pretty tiny budget. <laughs> you know, they have a pretty small budget for, they have kind of a small staff for, for that charge. But one of, so some of the hindrances so, that we've had are now we're shifting to the 21st century. We're no longer short of asphalt and plastic toys. We're really not short of it anymore. <laughs> we're, we're short of things like flood protection soil quality, we're short of air quality, water quality. If we want more salmon, we need more habitat. Boats and nets don't cut it anymore. Okay, so we need more of these natural services. We need the goods and services that the biocycle community is producing. And in fact, I would say that if you think about the role that GM, Ford, Chrysler pay, played during the period of the early 1900s into the 1920s, that's the role you're playing for a 21st century economy. We have new goals, sustainability. We have new measures looking at how we measure the value of the products and goods you're providing. New policies. We need new institutions to make sure that... A, I came from a family of dairy farmers, and my, they're still dairy farmers. And it's frustrating that they don't have a biodigester. It really is. <laughs> my uncle, it's tough. How can he get a biodigester? He's not a wealthy farmer and milk prices are rock bottom today. They're where they were in the 40s. So these are the problems. We need new institutions and a financing mechanism to bring it about. Think about this. In 1912, we didn't have roads really in this country. Then we set up a system where we got cities, counties, states, federal government, all funding roads. We spent trillions of dollars on roads. And now we have a lot of roads. Private industry, same thing with goods and services. We didn't have too many cars at that time. Now we have loads and loads of cars. And so we need to think about how to generate these things. And I'm going to, you know, we've got good measures for built capital. That's all the stuff that we produce, like chairs and cars and digesters. We don't have good measures for social capital, how we all get along, our laws, our, uh, when social capital breaks down, economies break down, our human capital, our education and knowledge. Uh, skills. We have to change that, just like I love biocycle and its role for education and composting and natural capital, the benefits we get from natural systems. And it's that last one that I'm going to kind of focus on here because now, just as GM and Ford produced a new product that transformed the economy, now you're taking things, waste, waste products, and producing goods and services. Now we need markets, we need a, a, the ability to measure these benefits. So ecosystem services, and I would say these are services not just out of only wild ecosystems, but farms, biodigesters, compost piles, etc. Um, ecosystem services are the benefits we get out of natural systems. What happens if we lose these natural services? Well, I'll give a case that we've worked on for quite a few years, uh, Louisiana. I'm from Washington State, but I went to school in Louisiana. Uh, to look at ecosystem services. This is what's happened to the Louisiana wetlands. We've lost 1.2 million acres of wetlands. And those wetlands are a buffer against hurricanes. New Orleans is there by Lake Pontchartrain, the Crescent City. You can see the Mississippi River winding through. And um, we cut canals in. We channeled all the water and sediment in the Mississippi down. And then we got Hurricane Katrina and it was a category five hurricane, huge hurricane. And if you measure the storm surge, the pile of water that it brings, it dwarfed all previous hurricanes unquestionably, slammed against the coast. We lost 30 linear miles along the path of Hurricane Katrina. Wetlands take one foot off the storm surge of a hurricane for every 2.5 miles. You reduce that huge pile of water. As it was, we still, it, the wetlands, before it hit the first levee, still took off half of all the storm surge with the degraded wetlands. But they called me because I worked on um, Hurricane Protection Valley wet wetlands, so they called me right after Hurricane Katrina. I was down there shortly after. This is the Ninth Ward. And you can see the demolition. Cost 1,400 lives, $200 billion, and um, huge amount of damage. Why is this important? Because once you start measuring, if you looked at our cost-benefit analysis, a levy counts. The wetlands don't count. So we built a lot of levees, huge number of levees, $40 billion worth of levees just in Louisiana since 1930. And they didn't work right. And we lost an asset that provided huge amounts of hurricane buffering, the wetlands. 
And since the analysis and since the Army Corps has said, wow, wetlands do provide a lot of benefits, they shifted $500 million to wetlands restoration. And putting in, in, in fact, there's going to be a shift of a lot more money toward west, wetland restoration because there's no way you can maintain that system. And when you think about the biocycle community and the vast amount, just as uh, Dennis mentioned, of just food waste, that is a resource we cannot waste. And we must be able to count the benefits. And if you count the benefits, you shift finance, you shift investment, both private and public investment. And that's why valuing are the services and goods we produce is so important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ecosystem services. There are all kinds of categories of these services, all of which the biocycle community has an impact on. Carbon sequestration, food, things like recreation, um, medicinal resources, that's the uh, the yew tree, which is a source of taxol. We didn't even know it was a benefit. It was Yew trees were slashed and burned across uh, millions of acres of the Northwest Forest as a junk tree. Then taxol is a key, was found by the University of Washington in the bark of the yew tree, cure for breast cancer and 20 other cancers. Not a perfect cure, but the best known cure. That turned out to be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So all of a sudden the junk tree became the most valuable tree. And that's what I like about the biocycle movement. You're discovering a huge amount of value where other people saw waste. And that needs to be recorded in accounting, in appraisals, in valuation. So I want to talk about the categories and think about where you fit in here. Um, goods. Goods are things that you can drop on your toe, OK? <laughs> like food, salmon. Um, like the gas from a biodigester. And goods are very easy to value. Compost should be considered a good. Very easy to value, in fact. They are very amenable to markets. We can trade them in markets, and private industry, private financing mechanisms are good mechanisms for goods. Another category are services. Services are things you can't drop on your toe, like soil formation, water quality, waste treatment, flood risk reduction, climate stability, water quality, sediment transport or erosion control, pest control. You know, um, the city of Denver, because, nat because of climate change and global warming, natural beetles have killed off the watershed. They have to do a gigantic $600 million water recycling plant because they're not going to get the same amount of water they got out of the watershed. This is, so these things, just natural pest control is a very big value. It's worth a lot, and we haven't counted it. So a lot of these services um, are also very easy to value these days. I can tell you how much an acre of wetland is worth for reduced um, storm damage for New Orleans. We can value that. And the same with waste treatment value, nutrient reduction, uh, et cetera. So, and, and yet many of these things are not amenable or easily amenable to market uh, mechanisms. This is, um, it's easy to trade in goods. Everybody wants goods, right? But when you want to trade in bads, that's a different matter. <laughs> Markets in bads don't just pop up. If we don't have the EPA or somebody saying, actually, you've got a nutrient limit or a carbon limit or something else, you won't have a market in that good or service. OK, so the difference between a market and goods and bads is the market in, uh, market in goods has to be regulated, otherwise people will cheat and, and sell you something that's bad, like uh, tainted milk or whatever. And the market in bads is a market that needs to be driven by a regulatory structure. And that's just reality. Uh, we had a nice nutrient trading uh, market, which in fact EPA was promoting in Boise. But since the, the city and all, they weren't going to put da clamp down enough on the TMDLs, well then there isn't going to be a market, because <laughs> why trade then? So one of the lessons is, and then there are also supporting functions, but one of the lessons is we have to understand how markets are created in the goods and services uh, for digesters, for compost, for the biocycle community. There are another set of functions, supporting functions, like biodiversity and habitat, nutrient cycling. Some of these can be valued. Some are more difficult to value. Some are quite difficult to value, but we're getting the techniques. And finally, looking at cultural functions, aesthetic value, recreation, cultural value, spiritual, etc. And I can tell you that, um, for instance, aesthetic value, there's a lot of value there. You look at the folks who have a view of Mount Hood or Mount Rainier or Puget Sound, their property values are higher. 
uh, just because of that aesthetic value. It doesn't include, include my aesthetic value because I don't have a property that views Mount Rainier, but I get a lot of the aesthetic value. So often we can only capture a portion of the value provided. And this is very typical of um, projects around the biocycle community where we can, we can measure some of the benefits very clearly, like in composting. Some of the benefits are more difficult. We need to make a lot more effort to measure them, health benefits and other things. So the first, I will talk about this more in my next talk on ecosystem services, but this is what we've done is adopt sort of a, an appraisal approach, which is very typical. Think about your house appraisal, business appraisal, etc. First, you want to mark out where value exists. So if you think about an operation where you're composting, what systems are affected? Who are all the downstream folks affected, the beneficiaries? And then we can put dollar values to those things. Um, and again, we use kind of a high and low values. I'll, this is, these are values that come out of peer-reviewed academic journals. And just to give one quick example, because we don't have too much time here, um, the Mississippi River Delta, we did evaluation of natural systems, including waste treatment value benefits. At a low, it's about $12 billion a year. Uh, at a high, it's somewhere around $47 billion per year. Now, some people go, well, that's such a big range, you know. What do you mean? How could you do that? But then I think about these shoes here, and uh, you know they were on sale for $140 at REI, and then I went to the garage sale and got them for 19 bucks. <laughs> so a lot of times, my natural science friends and environmentalists, they're like, I don't like all these numbers. They're just so, you know, they change so much. Well, that's the way economics works. <laughs> you know, Washington Mutual Bank was worth $306 billion in January 2008. By October, it was sold for 1.6 billion. Whoops, you know. <laughs> so the the fortunate thing is that the values that you're dealing with, like cleaner water, like building soil assets, those values are a lot more solid. They're more. They don't change like bank stocks do or or Wall Street stocks. Actually, they're they're much much more tangible. Like you look at the value of water, drinking water in the United States, very stable pricing structure. It doesn't just go way up and way down. So, and part of that is because of the utilities. Well, think about that. Now, e for each of your operations, you should think about this. Just like with soil, you're providing value every year. There's a flow of value, and then there's what we call the asset value. So, if you take all those values over years and amortize it or, or do a net present value calculation, then that 12 to 47 billion dollars as an asset the Mississippi Delta is worth about 300 to 1.3 trillion dollars just the Mississippi uh, um, just the Mississippi Delta think about we, we wanted to do we had a proposal to the agriculture department with Washington State University to look at soil and the value the dollar value provided of soil and who benefits and the asset value unfortunately it wasn't funded but, <laughs> but that's the kind of thing we need to fund because soil is an asset, a critical asset in the, this nation. When we didn't measure unemployment, Herbert Hoover came out and said, we don't, the depression's over when almost 25% of Americans were out of work because we didn't measure it. And now we're doing the same thing with soil. If you think about our composting systems, it's critical that we measure the value. Now, ecosystem services, and you think about whether it's my uncle's dairy farm or anyone else, Think about the benefits and how they flow. There are, and ecosystem services, those categories, they go move differently across the landscape. We had a National Science Foundation grant to look at this. And so if you look at water, like flood protection or other water-based services, wastewater treatment, etc., those are, are um, watershed-bound ecosystem services. So the beneficiaries of flood protection are down at the bottom of the watershed, whereas most of the provisioning is in the upper watershed by forests, wetlands, etc. Dams, levees as well. Aesthetic are view sheds, more or less. Carbon sequestration, sequestration is global. So when you think about a funding mechanism for a, a digester, something like that, you're providing benefits across different geographies. There needs to be sort of a, a, a larger scale funding mechanism, like the, Car the California Climate Initiative, for actually providing um, a funding mechanism for carbon sequestration, okay? Whereas it might be the flood district, this is our view, we think that the flood districts should be paying for more water infiltration. If folks are infiltr filtering water in or looking at just the water storage value of 
better soils and composted areas. In fact, we suggested a funding mechanism for the, for the Army Corps and FEMA looking at the value of farms for flood protection. And if that soil quality is higher, you're doing more infiltration. Uh, I did a, a talk, which I don't have the slides for here, but if you looked at the flood for all the National Association of Floodplain Managers, if you look at the Mississippi flood of 2011, the worst flood in U.S. history, after we had built $15 billion worth of uh, levees on the Mississippi, well, at the same time, farmers had tiled their millions of acres of their lands, that is, put these tubes in to take the water off their lands, make it a little more, you know, drain it a little faster, you can earn a little bit more money per acre. But that took trillions of gallons of water away from flood storage on farmlands, percolating into groundwater, keeping nutrients actually on the farmlands when they might, might do better rather than washing the Mississippi, quickly flushed it into the Mississippi, and then we flooded our most valuable urban uh, areas. Instead of the floodwaters coming down and flooding the cities, the floodwaters came down and just couldn't get through those big levees and flooded back up into Cedar Rapids, Cairo, a lot of other cities. So. If you think about the value that you're providing on the landscape, flood protection is one of those benefits. So as an economist, what I like to see is who's providing, who's got the provisioning assets? Who's got the biodigester? Who's got that composting uh, project, the waste treatment? Because that's the provisioning asset. From there, who are the beneficiaries and the impairments? So if you think of each one of those ecosystem services, and soil, for example, is key to more than half of them, then um, for, say, someone using uh, compost, you're increasing that, then you can map the beneficiaries and the impairers, and you bill the impairers, just like stormwater fees, you bill those who have impermeable surface, and you bill beneficiaries, like those receiving clean water, and you invest back into the provisioning assets. So what I'm talking about is how do we create some large and new funding mechanisms for the biocycle community because you're producing a great deal of value, which needs to be counted. And uh, But because my talk is short, you'll have to come to my next talk to hear more about that. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about why accounting is so important. Um, I worked on, I'm from Tacoma, Washington, but I worked on changing policies at the World Bank and some uh, large institutions. If you look at investment in China, why was there no investment in China in the early 80s and suddenly Everything is produced in China. Well, the first step, the very first step was the World Bank gave a loan to China to change their whole accounting system, to make their accounting compatible with North America, uh, Japan, and, and Europe. If you, can't, if you invest your money and you have no idea where it's going or what's happening to it, you're not going to invest your money there. And this is why it's so important. I'll give you one example here, Seattle Public Utilities. Um, SPU in 1898, they had cholera and typhoid, and lots of people died in Seattle. And uh, it was declared by the, Nat the, the uh, New York Times as the most unhealthy city in the United States. If you wanted to die fast, go to Seattle. Because they bought waste, <laughs> waste water, they pulled, we had four private utility water uh, companies, they pulled water out of Lake Washington, and of course waste also went into Lake Washington, so big problem. Uh, then the downtown burned down that year, and people created uh, 65 acres. Then we created this uh, utility, and the city just said, that's it, we're purchasing the utility. And I want you to think about this goal. Their goal was not to maximize present value with that investment. The goal was to provide um, clean water for the citizens of Seattle at any population in perpetuity. How about that for an economic goal? That is something. Provide water at any population, clean, potable water, in perpetuity. And it's more or less being achieved. So instead of building a filtration plant, Seattle and Portland's water here too is filtered uh, by natural systems. And th th those benefits, um, but, if you, but there's a problem with that, and I'll fast forward to it. So that filtration value alone of that watershed is worth $200 million. If you had to build a filtration plant, it would cost about $200 million. We don't have to build one. The trees do it for free. Um, and we don't have to build another filtration plant every 40 years. So um, critically, what I want to say is that uh, the asset sheet, though, of Seattle Public Utilities or San Francisco 
Seattle is a, or San Francisco is about five billion dollars. Seattle's one billion, and the the system that produces every drop of water, that watershed, and filters every drop of the water, counts as thirty-five million dollars on the asset sheet of a of a utility that has a billion dollars. Now, there's a problem with that. If you want to take a bond and put pipes in and build car or build get vehicles or build a building for Seattle Public Utilities, you you offer you know two hundred million dollar bond and it shows up as a liability on your asset sheet, you can raise your rates and the bondholders go, I'm gonna buy that because it showed up on their asset sheet and I see I'm gonna get paid back. And so there's, you've got a funding mechanism. And that's how built capital is, whether it's a power plant or anything else. Unfortunately, since the watershed doesn't show up, if Seattle Public Utility wants to remove roads for $10 million and improve water quality, more than building the $200 million filtration plant, it doesn't show up on the asset sheet. So how are you going to offer a bond and raise rates and do all these things for na this improvement in natural capital? And this is the conundrum still facing our community. As, as Dennis said, these markets are young. We need to have these funding mechanisms. It means we need to count value. So Seattle, uh, San Francisco, Portland here, New York City have come together to approach the Governmental Accounting and Standards Board to change accounting rules so that they can count the watershed as a full asset. And it means those utilities will probably double or more than double their assets. And actually, the important thing is, if they offer a bond and show that these assets are in good shape, they can get a lower rate even for their built capital. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further, but if you know you're gonna be at repaid because that's where your water source is and that's an asset in good shape, then um, purchasers of the, those bonds there's less risk, and so the interest rate is lower. Well, I'll just wrap up here. Whoops, for some reason I'm not going on to the next slide. Uh, well, I'll just wrap up by saying these are the tools for transition for the biocycle community. Really, it's um, looking at these, oops, a little bit slow, but changing accounting rules. We're working with the National Institute of Appraisers so that they can go out and say, yeah, this farm that needs a biodigester, this is an asset. This waste is an asset. An appraiser is never counted on it. If you go, I know because my dairy farming family, no appraiser is going to go out there and say that waste is an asset. Uh, but but actually, they should be saying that. So if you think about 1912, uh, changing accounting rules, changing funding mechanisms, looking at developing these markets, this is important. These are the same problems that GM had. This is the same type of prob problem that the early water utilities had. So we're in 2012 now and you are really at the basis of a 21st century economy because I'm very convinced that this economy in the 21st century will not be better off if we don't actually take the work that you're doing and expand it on a very large scale. This is the basis for a 21st century economy. So thank you very much. And as Nora said, I do have my new book with John DeGraff available. What's the economy for anyway? It's humorous, it's easy to read. Uh, the New York book, um, book review said it was in the top 10 um, economics books and the most readable and most fun of all the <laughs> so, so, and thank you very much. Oh, the last thing, I last thing I wanted to say, the first magazine to cover this book was BioCycle. It was really impressive. Isn't that great? So, thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you.